is Georgios. I'm one of the transplant surgeons from the Oxford Transplant Center. And I'd like to uh, show you our experience of how we promote uh, self-management from our patients and what we do uh, for the best of their care. So first of all, the doctor and patient relationship uh, is, is the foundation to a successful surgical journey. It is built on understanding, on confidence, and of course, communication. It is truly about a relationship that is actually a partnership. Uh, so what do we do to uh, enhance this experience? So at, at the Oxford Transplant Center, we take pride in uh, the way we communicate in our patients. We do uh, Skype clinics, uh, which actually save time and money for both sides. They avoid commuting to our center because we do intestinal transplants for the whole of the UK, so they have to travel from all the way from, from Scotland down to Oxford. Uh, and also we utilize encrypted uh, networking platforms such as WhatsApp, for example, in order to get instant review and give them instant opinions on what is the next step for the best of their uh, care. Uh, so, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. We have also changed our protocols, we've changed our surgical techniques in order to enhance the patient experience and promote patient-led monitoring and empower the patient. So, this is, for example, what we're doing nowadays. Uh, this is what we do with most of our intestinal transplant patients. So there's a small bowel inside the patient, and there's an abdominal wall transplant that is visual, that is something, is something visible that they can see every day. The reason to do this is because the skin is the more, most immunogenic organ. So our theory is that if there is a rejection coming, we can get, it, we can get some signs on the abdominal wall. So it's actually the skin that we rely on in order to get some signs of a, a forthcoming rejection. So when the patients, so we actually utilize this as a dynamic canvas. This is what we ask the patient to keep an eye on and you know, contact us in case they think that they are in trouble. So that's what I mean when I, get, when I say they get in trouble. This is the transplanted skin, which is a bit red and uh, this is from a biopsy. So obviously you can see there's a contrast from the native skin and the transplanted skin. So when they see something like this, they take a picture of the uh, of this transplanted skin, they send it to us and say, well, what do you think? Is there a problem here? Shall I do something? Or is, this, is it nothing happening? So we actually moved on from just from the abdominal walls for the intestinal transplant to utilize skin for other transplants as well. Or if there is no need for a big uh, transplant abdominal wall, we use this vascularized skin on the forearm. So it's like a watch. It's like a watch I can see every day when they wake up and see, you know, how, how is my uh, transplanted organ doing. So if they think that there is a problem with this, if there is a rash on it, they just take a picture and send it to us. And this is, for example, evidence of rejection on one of these flaps. So let's have a look in some ways that patients use in order to get in contact with us. So for example, here you can see that the patient sent me the readings from his thermometer and his vital signs. And also there's another patient that actually took a picture of the abdominal wall transplant and sent it directly to me. So in this way, we can actually get instantaneous review. We save time, dentrimental on time, and we can get an opinion straight away. And obviously the topics uh, vary. There are lots of topics why we, they would communicate with us. For example, here, this guy got worried, uh, what shall we do with the abdominal wall transplant, the bowel transplant, and we actually get some in-hostel feedback. This guy was actually an inpatient and sent me the report that was given to him from his uh, scope straight away so that I know well before he comes back to his bed. Oh, obviously, he gets some feedback about transportation was not booked for him, so he was a bit pissed off. <laughs> Uh, that's another one. You we get another picture of a abdominal wall transplant. I suggested that why do you come for a punch biopsy and we might need to give some steroids in order to calm down things over the terms of rejection. Uh, obviously, we're trying to cheer them up all the time. So, you know, I've suggested that there, there will be a bed available no matter what. <laughs> and uh, some others would, get some, would like some outpatient support. So they go to get some blood tests done and they would ask us, so what kind of blood test will you, will you need? So that's our way into enhancing this, this experience with the patient. We are empowering the patients to uh, get 
their health in their lives. They have to keep an eye on their uh, transplanted skin and get in contact with us when they think that they're in trouble. So besides uh, empowering the patient this way, and obviously everything is done with their consent. They actually consented to uh, this kind of communication and they are very happy to get involved. Uh, they actually, they, they've heard about this experience. We've published some papers about this. So they want to, get, to be the involved uh, in this kind of uh, uh, remote monitoring. So besides uh, having them to contact us instantly, we uh, have established some international collaborations in order to get extra opinions when uh, things do not go well. In our specialist area, there's very scarce evidence there's not much, there are not many intestinal transplants out there. So the evidence that we have uh, is, is, is not plenty. So when, when, there's a, when there's a problem, we'd like to get opinions from uh, all other centers worldwide. There are only a few centers. So for example, this is uh, an opinion that I wanted to get from someone that I wanted to put on the uh, transplant waiting list. There's a very challenging uh, patient with lots of immunological uh, problems. So I wanted to see what other centers would do. And that's what I did. And everything started with, from my, uh, you know, between myself and my mentoring teacher. He, we used to work together and then he moved to another continent. And we continued this kind of communication with these encrypted platforms. So obviously no data, no identifiable data are there. And uh, data exchange is, is actually kept to a minimum. Uh, whereas patient safety is still remains at the maximum. So we try to get the best for our patients. And uh, Besides myself and my mentor teacher, we've, we've uh, expanded to other centers, we've expanded to the States and to South America, so we get opinions from everywhere. And for example, this is another case where someone had the problem with a liver transplant and he wanted to get some opinions from uh, you know, more experienced guys from other centers. And sometimes it, it's good to pick some more brains uh, because you might not see the obvious. So uh, in this way, uh, by utilizing these platforms, we do empower center, our patients, everyone is included, and uh, everyone is doing the best uh, to get our patients uh, uh, care to the max. Thank you. Yeah, that's a very good question. So first of all, we don't use uh, any identifiable data, so there are no names. Uh, especially with the international collaboration, there's no name mentioned. So there's no way of someone to uh, tell who is the guy you're talking about. But the other thing is that what's most important is most of these patients are, is actually a matter of patient of uh, life or death. So when we get to this point, uh, obviously patients would like their life saved. I, a couple of weeks ago, I had a patient of mine who was uh, admitted in a hospital in Paris, and he went straight to ITU. So in this kind of in this case. Obviously, uh, what our priority is to save our patient's life. So we're going to give uh, information to the uh, medical team there uh, in order to get to try them to get them out of trouble. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Sorry. Um, for where I come from, I've known that uh, a lot of doctors do WhatsApp also internally. So do you use it also internally within the ward, uh, collaborating between wards? And yes. Yeah, definitely. So we have these groups, uh, for example, the, the registrars of the ward or the consultant team. So we do exchange data uh, in order to see, for example, what jobs are left, uh, what's a hot topic now, and what should we do when it comes to challenging cases. So we, yes, indeed, we do use uh, the platforms. Doctors are used to having appointments with cert at certain times. When you introduce these exchanges with patients, the patients may write or contact you at any time. What kind of um, return answer uh, schedule do you uh, offer to them? Yes, it's a very good question. Um, well, the good thing is that there are not many uh, patients that are involved, for example. The, the, the program with a, a bowel transplant is not a big one. So uh, we're looking at less than 50 patients involved. Uh, so when that's the case, you can get an instant report. So when I, I have my phone on all the time, for example, so they could contact me on Saturdays, Sundays, anytime during day or night, 
and uh, I will uh, respond straight back to them. Uh, if I don't, obviously they know to uh, go to the emergencies uh, to, and uh, they will contact me. How, how scalable is it? How many doctors would be as dedicated? Uh, it's, yes, it, it's difficult to ask this question, but it's, it's not e that easy. So it would take someone to be on call for the specific, uh, for example, uh, specialist area in order to give some uh, qualified questions. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I'm curious as to <clears throat> whether you've tried to talk to the BMA to get them on board. Mm -hmm. and to give you some of the background, my research is in privacy uh, on health-related social networking sites. Uh, I've used WhatsApp groups mm -hmm. clinically. Yes. Um, in one particular institution, we were all shut down mm -hmm. from using them. Um, and they actually quoted the BMA policy, yes. even though the Canadian Medical Association supported it. And so there's a lot of, if I can say, old thinking yes. rather than, than new thinking being introduced to this. And I think, uh, I mean, there's platforms like Figure One, mm -hmm. which allow this sort of collaboration, but most importantly, how is this going to be translated to policy so it can continue to be done? Mm -hmm. It's a very good point. So we've had our problems as well with our own trust. It took us a couple of years to get permission for the Skype clinics. Uh, so it, it's very difficult to get uh, these organizations actually uh, along with you in this journey. And it takes lots of bureaucracy. Uh, but you know, our, our, our main thing here is that when it comes to a matter of life or death, uh, well, I'm not going to care about privacy that much. I get the consent from all the patients. All the patients give us consent that they want their data to be shared with us and with other uh, you know, experts in the field. And no one can actually see the patient. We, we give all the data available, but no one can say, well, this patient, this guy in your center, there's nothing to identify the patients. Uh, but I, I know what you mean with the privacy, and uh, it's, it's good. It's a good idea to get the BMA involved. But yes. Oh, with me, no, no, I'm afraid not. I don't have that consent here. But we do consent them once, once, once. <laughs> so Michael is uh, one of our pioneering transplants, and uh, uh, we do get the consent for when we first see someone in the clinic. Uh, and everybody is very keen to uh, share the data uh, because they know it's actually to their benefit. So we, they know that we're not going to do this for fun. We're going to do this to get the best care available. So even if I, I don't know something about their care, I'm going to get an opinion from another center that has more experience in this field. Uh, so that's why we get the consent and patients are uh, fully involved in this. So we have time for one more question. When you WhatsApp with patients, I, I don't know if it's a legal obligation, but you're, when you treat patients, you're legally obligated to write or to document the, the, yeah. the call. Do you save these WhatsApps? To, is it part of, your, uh, of what you say you consult your patients, or it's like uh, consulting on social media? So it's, is it specific? How do you handle uh, the documentation part? Yeah, that's a good point. So I always transfer the consultation onto the EMR records that we have. So we use the EPR in the NHS. So whenever I consult someone, uh, even in the, in the retrospective fashion, I will go and put this in their notes, saying that I was contacted this day at that time uh, with this question, and that's what I answered, so that everything is documented.